Today we are going to go through an exercise which will help us understand how functional genomic tools are used to to understand a cellular function for example so far what we have covered we have, we have talked about you know a, a question uh, which is let's say we are interested in uh, in the eye development okay using a genetic approach um, we perform a genetic screen in drosophila and after the genetic screen, we look, compare the wild type eyes, which look like a beautiful symmetrical structure. And we select our mutants based on the eye phenotype. We have many mutants, let's say, um, where eye is, you know, deformed, D shaped. Um, you know, the structure is disturbed, the omatidia look rough or not so uh, symmetrical. So based on the phenotype, we uh, select the eye mutants. We go through, you know, uh, classical genetic crosses and we determine whether mutations are dominant or recessive, and eventually we uh, group them in different complementation groups. Once we know how many alleles and uh, non-allelic mutations we have discovered, next thing is indeed we map the gene It depends what mutagen we used. If we used P elements uh, or we used enhancer trap. So in these cases, it's easy. We simply do inverse PCRs to know the location of the uh, insertional mutagenesis due to these elements. Or if we have used EMS mutagenesis, then indeed we use recombination mapping. Once we determine which chromosome carries the mutation, we'll, we'll see, you know, co-segregation of the phenotype. Uh, and then, uh, through recombination mapping, we know the gene of interest. So once you know the gene of interest, so this is the point from where the job starts. This is the point from where you have to link this newly discovered gene with I phenotype. And the questions you simply have, how this gene, we can call this gene X, is involved in I development. What functional domains this gene X encodes, which means what kind of proteins, uh, what kind of protein is being decoded from gene X? Can we find some specific 
domains, amino acid domains in that. So once we know the gene, we try to do all possible bioinformatic analysis. which indeed include you need to determine whether the protein is nucleus localized or it's cytoplasmic or it's a membrane plasma membrane uh, protein inserted in plasma membrane etc because once you know it it goes to nucleus or cytoplasm or plasma membrane that gives you an idea for your uh, future strategy about understanding the function of this gene. You, after knowing some domains, and let's say there are no domains, it's a totally novel gene. Nothing is known about this. You run bioinformatic analysis to look for homologs in other systems like humans, mouse, etc. And you find that, yeah, there are homologs maybe, but they are also not characterized. So now experimentally, so you, you, you can analyze as much as possible using bioinformatics, but eventually we have to go and decipher the function. The very first thing which you have to prove is is you have to show correlation. Uh, you have to show correlation between gene X and eyes. In flies, normally if you are working in flies or mouse, um, you know, you have to show that this gene is actually expressed in eyes. which means you have to have tools. There are different tools. For example, you can do in-situ hybridization or you can do immunostainings. And for immunostaining, it means you need to have antibody against gene X. And if you don't have antibody against gene X, I would say whenever you discover a new gene and if there's no new antibody available, you should generate antibody against X. What you do, you simply look at the protein sequence of the gene X and choose a region which shows high antigenicity, there are amino acids which are high, more antigenic than others, and you design cloning strategy to clone this region. Okay. And after cloning, you express this antigenic X region in bacteria and go for raising polyclonal antibodies in rabbits. Or you can choose other systems as well, okay? Once you inject in rabbit, okay. the rabbit is going to show immune response and then you, know, you do a booster injection, which means another injection of the same antigenic protein and after three to four injections you know with a gap of 
two weeks maximum. So a month, uh, uh, a bit more than one month protocol. Finally, you bleed, you kill the rabbit, you bleed the rabbit, and from the serum, you purify antibodies. Now you can use this antibody or you can use in situ hybridization, but in situ hybridization is going to detect mRNA. Antibody is going to detect protein. You simply can take larval imaginal disk from third in star larva and from the third in star larva, this is how the eye imaginal disk look like. You have at this stage, you also have the wing disk, the halter disk, you know, the, uh, the brain disk, etc. So you stain imaginal disk with the antibody against X and look for expression pattern. Let's say you see expression of X only in, in the I imaginal disk like this. So all these reds are the staining pattern. So this gives you confidence that yeah, this is a very much eye specific gene because although the gene is present in wing imaginal disc, halter cells which make this, all the rest of the body, but its expression is wing specific. Okay. Then, so this is basically in the wild type. If you compare your mutant So this is, for example, delta X, mutant in the gene X. And what you see, there is no expression of X, which means due to mutation in X, the protein is not being formed. And as compared to the wild type in the mutant X, you don't have expression. This is the correlation which, which tells you that, yeah, my gene is um, causing this phenotype. It's not proof, but it's a correlation. Now, in order to prove that X is indeed indeed responsible for I phenotype. Normally what we do, we clone full length gene X under its own promoter and make transgenic flies. You simply inject larvae uh, not larvae, sorry. You inject embryos 
not larvae. You inject the pole cells in embryo. We talked about them in the earlier lectures. And then once you have transgenic flies, transgenic flies which contain gene X, which we inserted, we cross these flies with mutant this gene X mutant. And after a couple of crosses, what we want, we want gene X transgene. If it can be made homozygous and we should have Delta X over Delta X, which means homozygous mutant both the endogenous copies are mutated. If they survive, if they are alive and have normalized like wild time, we say the mutant phenotype caused by homozygous Delta X is being rescued by transgene. And we call this experiment genomic rescue. Is it clear so far? Yes, sir. Good. Sir, genomic rescue ko thoda sa dobara please bata de, explain kar den thoda aur. So genomic rescue basically refers to cloning full length gene X, making transgenic flies and then through crossing, bring it to the mutant, make mutant homozygous in that fly. Normally, if homozygous flies are dead, if in the presence of homozygous transgene or even single transgene copy, if it can rescue, we will say the mutant phenotype caused by homozygous delta X delta X mutation is being rescued by the transgene. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. You can also do immunostaining here in the transgene. You already have anti X antibody. And in these rescued flies, we stain and we may see expression pattern, which we detect in normal wild time. Okay. So these are two very critical experiments in which first you prove that your, your uh, mutant, it indeed lacks expression of gene X in the eye region. And this phenotype is most likely due to gene X because it's mutated there. And next is when you show expression of transgene in the mutant background can rescue the mutant phenotype. This is indicating that there is no second site mutation which is responsible for this mutant phenotype. The phenotype is indeed caused by mutation in gene X because it's wild type copy. This is very important. The transgene which you, it's a wild type copy. Often students make mistake and they say, we'll clone the mutant gene. There's no use of cloning the mutant gene here. It won't rescue the uh, mutant phenotype. So these are two very crucial early experiments you should think on. Then comes, you know, because we have uh, strong mutant phenotype. Um, 
what we early on saw, if you, we have, for example, gene X over gene X mutation, okay? So, which means homozygous, if they are dead, so this, you know, this death of homozygous mutation, it actually prevents us from going deep and understand the molecular function. So understanding of molecular function is hindered by, because mutant is dying, let's say homozygous mutant dies at early embryonic stage or late embryonic stage. So we cannot really understand the molecular function of gene X in later part of development when I imaginal disc is formed or I uh, adult eye is formed. So we go back to flies and we say, okay, let's try. So we already saw mutant phenotype. We already saw correlation of expression of X in the eye imaginal disc. We also could rescue the mutant phenotype with the wild type gene X. So you say, okay, let's try to knock it down using RNAi. We knock down gene X specifically in eyes. What we do, we can use US construct with inverted repeat. Inverted repeat means the gene X is cloned in such a way. Then there's an intronic region and then gene X is in the antisense. So when this construct is, so it's cloned like this. Then there's the spacer intron and then in the opposite direction, same segment. This one is cloned in this orientation. And when this will be expressed, since this is complementary to this one, it will make a hairpin loop, double-stranded RNA construct. We call this double-stranded RNA when, when it is transcribed. Using US GAL4 system, we can combine this with, for example, uh, tissue-specific GAL4, GAL4 drivers. Uh, we can use GMR. GAL4 driver, or we can use ILS, ILS GAL4. These GAL4s are expressed specifically in the I region. So by crossing our RNAi gene X lines with GMR or ILS GAL4, we again try to monitor the I phenotype. And see what, what kind of structure the adult eye has. Okay. We can also uh, stain I imaginal disk with we have antibody anti X and we try to see. So this is the wild type expression pattern of gene X and in knockdown this one we should see diminished expression of X because of knockdown. And again, what we observe, maybe not this drastic, but there is a phenotype, I specific phenotype.
we also make use of another tool in flies because you saw this one. When you have homozygous X mutant, flies were dead at late embryonic stage or early embryonic stage. Now to understand the function of X late during development, we make use of FLIP FRT system in flies. So this is a recombinase. And this system originally, originally it exists in, in the yeast. But fly geneticists, they have used it as a tool to make lethal mutations homozygous late, later during development. Flip is, flip is, is an enzyme which recombines homologous regions which contain FRT sites are basically nucleotide sequences. So wherever you will have, for example, FRT and FRT, flip is, is going to recognize this and cause recombination. What we do, we recombine gene X mutation. It depends on which chromosome it is. If it is on chromosome three, on which arm of chromosome three it is. It is on the right or it is on the left. If it is on the chromosome two, again, it matters. It's very important you need to know it is on chromosome 2R or 2L on the left arm or right arm of chromosome. So let's say this mutation is on the third chromosome and this is where your mutation is, X. Now you will use FRT flies so flies which contain FRT, okay? And you want to have mutation X recombined next to that. So this is 3R and this is 3L, left arm of chromosome. You take FRT flies on 3R, you cross them with gene X over TM stubble and you select flies FRT 3R over gene X. You again cross them now with TM tubby TM stubble balancer line and now since this will be female, you will make sure you use female here because in males, there is no recombination. If X and FRT are sufficiently far apart on chromosome, you know, there will be recombination. And in the next progeny, what we want to ensure we have FRT 3R recombined with gene X over TM stubble or TM tubby whatever. Eventually we make homozygous fly, FRT3R, gene X, okay? And we have TM tubby or stubble, whichever balance. We cannot make this one homozygous because due to homozygosity of gene X, it will be lethal. You should also 
have another line which carries heat shock flippase enzyme on X chromosome. It's normally on the X and you will soon see why. You have wild type chromosome two and you have FRT3R and FRT3R. This fly line is crossed with your gene X recombined with FRT3R and you will have in next progeny FRT3R gene X over FRT3R and here you also have ubiquitin, ubiquitous expression of GFP. Here you have UBI GFP, ubiquitous expression of GFP. So this chromosome, this one, has this ubiquitous GFP, and then you have FRT3R gene X. You will have also heat shock flip here. Okay. And what you do, you will, once you will do heat shock, it will activate flippase, and flippase is going to bind. I draw here. Let's say FRT3R. FRT3R, UBI, GFP, and here indeed you have gene X. Once you induce heat shock flippase, flippase is going to act on these FRT sites and cause recombination. Remember we do this once we cross these flies, they, these flies crossed with these ones, they lay eggs, and we, after 48 hours after eggling, AEL means after eggling, we give heat shock. After 48 hours of eggling, and heat shocking cause activation of recombinase, which goes and bind there. So after 48 hours in flies, this will be late second in star larva stage. Due to this recombinant, because this is mitosis is taking place. Organism is going to grow through mitosis. And let's say we have here, I try to draw the imaginal disk. All these are mitotic cells here. All of them will receive heat shock and flippase will be active, but not all the cells, all 100% of the cells will show such recombination. What will happen at the time of mitosis when this recombination takes place? So due to recombination, during mitosis, And this mitosis is taking place, homologous chromosomes, homologs, which contain 3R FRT sites. So you have one of the mitotic chromosome carries FRT3R gene X and the other one carries FRT ubiquitous GFP. 
due to recombination at this stage, what has happened that one of the, so mitosis results in two identical cells. Two identical cells originally without mitotic recombination, without flippase, the two identical cells should look like heterozygous. Heterozygous for what? So FRTX is the mutation and FRT ubiquitous GFP. And the other daughter cell should also look like this. But due to recombination, what has happened, the end result is one cell will contain FRTX over FRTX due to the combination here like this. And the other cell will contain FRT, GF, uh, FRT GFP and FRT GFP. So these two cells, now whenever they will divide, they will produce their progeny. Whenever these two, this cell will divide, this cell will provide progeny, which will be homozygous for GFP with FRT. You can identify these homozygous for G, uh, FRTX due to absence of GFP. They will look like this. A black hole surrounded by strong GFP expression, very, very strong GFP expression because you have homozygous GFP and we call these homozygous strong GFP as twin spots. And this is your, the GFP minus region is your, what is this? This is somatic clone. We call this somatic clone or flip FRT clone. Okay. And here, since now this contains X mutation homozygous, you can stain for I specific genes. Due to mutation in X, maybe some I specific genes which are known in literature, they are either overexpressed or completely absent. Clear so far? Yes, sir. So, what you have done? You have used another tool, which was flip FRT to analyze effect of homozygous X mutation at later stages of development and identified that, let's say, um, genes A, B, C, which are I specific genes, their expression is disturbed in these somatic clones and you 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 go one step ahead in characterizing the gene x or in characterizing the mutant phenotype by showing that the i specific genes are misregulated due to homozygous mutation of gene x okay these were kind of you know You used RNAi, you used genomic rescue, you used FLIP FRT. All these are routinely used functional genomic tools, but still we don't understand how gene X is contributing to the eye development, though we showed that some of the eye specific genes are misregulated, overexpressed, or reduced due to absence of X in the flip FRT clones. However, two questions still remain to be answered and they're very important. Question is how 
x is involved in i development how x plays a role in i development basically you are saying that i development is a very systematic process let's say there are 300 genes involved in in the eye development how these 300 genes respond in the presence of x mutation what we do we say okay we are going to isolate i imaginal disk mutant and wild time separately we isolate total rna from both and get them sequenced what we are looking for we are looking for wild type versus mutant expression profile when you compare messenger rnas expressed in mutant versus messenger rnas being expressed in wild type maybe you find you know these 200 genes they are upregulated another 250 genes they are downregulated what is discovery here discovery is you know at least some of the tar targets it could be many of these genes are secondary effect secondary effect means gene x it plays its role in regulating a a regulates b and then B regulates, let's say, I specific gene. But this is just one example I'm giving you. There could be some in which gene X is directly regulating some of these genes. Clear so far? Yes, sir. Now, there are different possibilities. G this gene X, it could be a cell signaling protein. Let's say it's a receptor tyrosine kinase or a, or a MAP kinase or whatever, you know, some signaling. Or this gene X is a transcription factor. So you have to find, because your gene is totally novel, you have no idea, no homology, no. But if you could localize, and let's say you localized your gene X, when you localize in the, you have already antibodies, okay? This experiment you do right away. When you have antibody, you do right away. Wild type, when you do wild type versus mutant staining, it will show you, that your antibody is going to nucleus and in the nucleus we know what is in the nucleus in the nucleus you have chromosomes or then there's nucleoplasm there's nucleolus so then deeply you have to see where in wild type gene x is present is it present on chromosomes or no and if it is in the cytoplasm, 
if it is not a nuclear protein and if it is in the cytoplasm you have to determine where in the cell it is is it a cell membrane protein is it a nuclear periphery protein or is it a you know golgi body protein or you know uh, mitochondrial protein etc let's say the protein you have discovered is a transcription factor or so we don't know yet the transcription factor let's take a step back it goes to nucleus your antibody tells you it's a nuclear protein and then carefully looking at the nuclear protein you find it's going on to chromatin now since you already saw 200 genes going up 200 genes going down when you do expression profiling through microarrays or next generation sequencing of the messenger rna of wild type versus mutant you try to see if x binds chromosomes if x is a dna binding protein you already have antibody you do immune staining in third in star larvae there are giant chromosomes in the salivary glands of third in star larvae and these giant salivary these uh, salivary glands they contain giant chromosomes which are called polyteen chromosomes you can simply use polyteen chromosomes and immunostain with anti x and try to carefully observe under high resolution microscope if you see specific binding sites of x this gives you idea x is going on to it goes to the nucleus and then within the nucleus it binds to chromatin and you try to correlate now that going to nucleus may regulate these 200 300 genes next thing you can do you can do chromatin ip why we are doing chromatin ip because we want to see chromatin binding of x we want to discover where on chromosomes x binds what are targets of x on chromosomes clear yes sir so this chromatin ip is also called chip chip stands for chromatin immuno precipitation chromatin immuno precipitation so your today's assignment is go and read what chip is how chip is performed after chromatin ip is performed you find you know 100 gene regions on which this gene x antibody shows us the signal we can do chip sec so chromatin immuno precipitation followed by next generation sequencing which will give you genome wide binding sites of x is it clear so far yes sir now we know that there are 100 
genes which are bound physically by gene X through sequencing, next generation sequencing. And since the genome is completely sequenced, you try to compare binding sites of X, X binding sites in the genome. And you try to see if there is something common in all these 100 binding sites. In terms of sequence, as well as in terms of position of the sequence in a genome. Let's say we find X is actually binding to this region and this region is transcription star site or its promoter or it could be enhancers of genes which are I specific. It neither binds to transcription star site nor to promoter, but enhances of all the genes which are expressed in I. So you find something big now. You found some sequence motifs, some DNA sequence, etc., which is attracting X to specific regions of genes which are regulated only on the I. Clear? Yes, sir. Now, you see, you started from mutant screen here, and you are making headway, you are making progress in linking X to I specific phenotype and now linking it to genes which are specifically expressed in the eyes and you conclude why you see such a strong I phenotype due to mutation of X because you find targets of X. And within those targets, you find specific DNA sequences, which are bound by gene X and through which it regulates. You ask one more question. You say, okay, what happens? if I ectopically express X. Ectopic expression means away from natural location. So what is the natural location of X? X naturally is expressed only in eyes. You say, okay, I will use US GAL4 system and I'll express X ectopically in wings or legs, etc. And now you are going to see in transgenic flies where you have. X is being expressed in the wings or in the legs. Do you see eye development here? Because X is now available in the legs and all the genes in the legs, which are normally expressed only in the eye, they have X available for them here in the legs as well as here in the 
wings and you want to see if you see I phenotype or something similar to I. Yeah, we can do immunostaining in the wing and the leg imaginal disc. We can also do these, all these analysis, their expression profile to see if targets of X are active there now, which must be previously silent. Or to begin with, before immunostaining, you simply express the using us gal4 system you express x ectopically in wing or leg and then try to see if we see an eye development in the wing disc in the wing adult wing or i have legs and do i see eye on the leg something like this clear Yes. So all these are functional gen genomics tools. So the tools we have studied in development, you know, we have seen um, segmentation screen where we saw maternal genes, payroll genes, gap genes, etc. All these are characterized one way or the other using these tools. You already found, for example, X binding sites here. You found new information hidden within the genome. Within the genome, there are DNA sequences which are being, you know, bound by I specific proteins and then I specific genes are being fired or being switched on. One thing is remaining and you say, okay, is X working alone? And no gene or protein works alone in the cells. We know that proteins, they come in complexes. But we only know X. So this is now biochemistry hardcore biochemical question but 21st century in 21st century you cannot understand detailed mechanism unless you know the interacting partners we call this inter ectom or x interacting partners you already have antibody against gene X. It has to be really good antibody. Should not recognize non-specific proteins. And you simply do co-immunoprecipitation. Your antibody is going to bind to the X. You pull it down and all its interacting partners will also come down but remember the real real challenge is biochemistry biochemical purification of complex and since it was a novel protein nothing is known about this after co-ip you simply use mass spectrometry to know and mass spec by ionizing these proteins, because these fragments, all these proteins are trypsinized and injected into mass spec, and then mass spec, mass spec give us uh, mass of different amino acids in each peptide, and then those sequences are deduced and through 
tools associated with mass spec, you can say, okay, X interacts with B, A, M, Z, L, N, etc. This picture now gives you a complex, a big complex of proteins. And you have to now decipher how X is playing its role on genome where it recognized specific sequences, very, very specific sequences on the chromosome three, two, and X. Is it clear? I have a question. Yeah, please. There is so Peter, uh, you know, useful to detect the masses. I mean, it's a physical instrument and might destroy or, you know, denature the protein. Is this, is this suitable? Yeah, otherwise you won't be able to identify, you cannot sequence, like DNA can be sequenced only a certain stretch. So for mass spec also we, for example, if I purify the complex, I trypsinize them. So trypsin is a protease, which, you know, if this is a protein, the specific recognition sites of trypsin and it converts this full length protein into short peptides, overlapping ones. Okay. All these are overlapping fragments. Now, once you will inject it into mass spec, let's say these are nine or 10 amino acids. It does not have a way to right away tell its sequence. So it ionizes this, then it determines mass of each amino acid. And then it gives you a peak that consists of mass of these amino acids. And there are automated softwares which tells you what is the peptide sequence of this first one. Since these are overlapping, you know the full length sequence of the protein. And when you blast all of them against protein database of let's say fly, it will immediately tell you this is this protein. Clear? Yes. So this is how you should prepare your uh, genetics and genomics. This is how you should read when you read about maternal genes, gap genes, payroll genes. We we already did this kind of analysis in, uh, in the uh, homeotic genes or segmentation genes, wingless. But there, since we were trying to learn the fundamentals and the concepts, we did not solve a problem or something which we would say, okay, uh, this is how I learned wingless binds to, um, you know, uh, cell membrane and then regulate hedgehog or engraved, and, or this is how engraved binds to uh, chromatin and regulate genes. All the facts which we talked about in those lectures, they were discovered through these functional genomic tools. And these tools are getting more and more uh, sophisticated. They are, we are learning more and more, uh, you know, how easily we can characterize these genes. So as I said, your today's assignment is go back, read in detail how chromatin immunoprecipitation is done. Okay. And what are major benefits of chromatin immunoprecipitation and what could be caveats or uh, weaknesses of chromatin immunoprecipitation. Any questions? Are there any questions?
So if there are no more questions, then thank you very much. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz, sir. Thank you. All the others can go. Najma can stay here. You need to leave. Oh, sorry, sir. G. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.